Hello, and welcome to Pivotal Moments, a podcast sharing, exploring, and celebrating stories of change, big or small. We are all agents of change and have the power to pivot at any point at any time. I'm your host, Melissa Robana, along with my co-host, Cydia Gutierrez. On this episode, we interview Zach Mathers. Zach is a former pastor who now runs a nonprofit with his wife, helping foster kids and hosts the podcast, Braving the Journey. Zach shares how shame led to his alcohol addiction and how family and community ties fuel his ongoing recovery. Um, So let's just start from the beginning. Um, Maybe kind of share a little bit about what led to your addiction. Yeah. um, I guess it's like, how far do you want me to go? Um, You know, for me, so my addiction to alcohol... um, it's a funny thing because it was a really hard thing to accept um, personally. And I think also because um, when I started attending AA meetings in the world of AA, I didn't even feel like I fit in there. Um, what I mean by that is like so many people in the rooms of AA were, um, had story, had this like traumatic childhood. And I'm like, mm, my parents love me. They're still married. That's, you know, like, and, and, but, um, I kind of began to realize like trauma for me existed differently um, than everybody else, but it was kind of almost like self-induced trauma that I, my actions kind of chose, um, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I, do you guys want to hear like the whole story? Or, yeah. 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 Or I where? think that, I think that'd be a great place to kind of start. Cause I'm, um, I'm definitely interested in in talking about that AA experience because it's there. But let's let's start at the beginning, you know, kind okay. of. Um, so yeah, I mean, just like beginning my story, um, I did. I grew up in a loving home, um, great parents. My mom was actually a marriage and family therapist, um, so all my friends growing up would come over to my house to get therapy from my mom for free, and uh, it was just kind of the way. But you know, it was uh, it was great. It, but. Um, I did. I grew up kind of with this, if I put my mind to anything, I was able to do it um, mentality. I started a nonprofit at the age of like 19 and was doing stuff all over the world with short little documentaries and um, just started a pastor in a church at a really young age. I was like 23. And, you know, so it was kind of one of those like, man, anything I was kind of just, they, things were happening for me in that regard. And then three years into uh, pastoring the church, I, I got completely, I got to the space where I put on this belief for myself that I had to be, have it all figured out and all together. And inside I wasn't inside. I was stressed. I was anxious. I was struggling. I was just about to become a dad for the first time. I was scared at all these different things. And I felt like in my r- role that I had, I wasn't supposed to share that or be vulnerable with that and so why do you think that 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 you felt that that you couldn't actually show your true self um so i grew up in the church and um i culturally i feel like the church sometimes says put on a happy face and like look like it's everything's okay um you know and i think i i began to believe that uh, even a uh, earlier age than that, like I, in high school, I was exposed to pornography and I would struggle and I would see it every once in a while and it would leave this guilt and shame inside of me. But I was afraid to share that with anybody because that's something you don't talk about. And so it became like this thing that I would hide um, and struggle with internally on my own. And so, uh, you know, I just, I was surrounded by people that it, on the outside, everyone would look like they were doing great. And I didn't have a lot of people that were just messy and, and sharing their mess per se. And then I put my, and then I put myself at a young age in this role of senior pastor. And so a part of it is I put it on myself to think like, I have to be this way versus I, at the opportunity, I had the chance to be like, I could be vulnerable and share and probably invite this community into doing that too. I just didn't have the wisdom to learn that at that age, I guess. Mm -hmm. Do you think it was that the, the people around you, uh, were really good at hiding their mess or were they just actually squeaky clean kind of people? No, nobody's squeaky clean people. Um, I think people were good at hiding it. Um, you know, 
I, yeah, I think there's people that don't struggle with, the, you know, the things that the outside world goes, whoa, that's big. But like, I, I just, I believe everyone's got some internal stuff that they're fighting through, whether it's little amounts of shame or if it's anxiety or if it's fears or if it's these things, we just have a tendency to repress those and put on the, you know, our Sunday best, if you would say. Um, so yeah, so I'm in this kind of role as a pastor, becoming a new dad. Um, and I'm at that point, it's kind of split between I have, um, financially the church wasn't able to fund me fully. So I went and got a job as like a server at a restaurant just to like help cover some cost of living. And, um, so I was kind of split energy wise, like to the max. Um, and I ended up having an affair and in that process for me, um, there was so much shame and guilt that came with it that I, um, I really didn't know how to like even cope with what I did. Cause it was one of those, like, for me, it was one of those things that you talk about going, man, I will never do that. I would never be that person. I would never do this thing. And then when you break it, it's like, you're almost breaking this like internal, like, wait, am I even really who I say I am? You know, in, and, and I, I lived with it for a while. Like I kept pastoring the church and I just felt completely fake. Like everything inside of me was broken. And yet I kept putting on this outside, like it's okay. Um, and I couldn't do it anymore. And so uh, one night I came home and just, just shared everything that happened with my wife. And um, it kind of, yeah, it just, you know, it opened up right there. And so I shared with her, she left right away with our newborn son and actually in all places headed towards my parents' house. I said, I'm going to your parents. And so I called them right away and just said, hey, here's what happened. We can talk about it more, but um, take care of my wife. She's headed to you guys. And then I called the elders of the church and said, hey, I need to share with you guys what happened. And um, yeah, and so at that point I had lost kind of my marriage, my job, uh, my community and I don't say these things at all to make it feel like this, like, oh, poor Zach. Because th those are th those are consequences of my choices and my actions, um, you know. But it's it was just the reality. That's where I was, you know. And um, so I started kind of self medicating with alcohol, just because I was in such a lost, shameful spot and not knowing where to how to get out of it that when i would drink it would at least would go away for this this moment you know moments and and so i found i began to like those moments where did your faith at this point lie um i never stopped believing i guess so you'd say but I think there's like a difference between belief and active faith. Um, mm. And I don't think I had a very active faith uh, for quite some years through like after this process, even um, I think there was even some anger, you know, mm. anger at um, probably not directed properly anger, but anger towards God being like, why, why, why would this happen to me? Why, why do you, you know, as if like it was his fault. Um, but you know, I still always, for me, have had a, had a belief, but I, yeah, it took a while for me to get to a place again where um, I felt like I even wanted to have a conversation with God because I, I felt so much shame. I felt like I wasn't worthy to even consider to look at, you know, be a Christian or, you know, like it was just one of those weird, like I felt rejected by the church. I was hurt kind of by that. Mm -hmm. um you know so what do you think what do you think was really the root of that shame what was it the affair was it something else that was going on i think it was it was it was a lot for me a lot of it was the affair it was the fact that i broke a, a golden rule you would say in your life that you never would and so that kind of just broke me and it broke me to the point of you know i felt like 
not only did the affair like kind of wreck my marriage at this point, but it, it also, I felt like I really had, had damaged and hurt the church. I had people come up to me in the church that were just like, man, I don't even believe in Jesus anymore. I don't believe in this thing. I'm out, you know? And it was like, I was like, okay, like, okay. You know, like, I can't help you. I don't know what to say to that, but like, okay. You know? And so like, there was this weight that I felt like, and I watched this like small community, but I watched it kind of just crumble too, you know? And I was just like, Oh, like, so I felt like not only did I have an effect on my marriage and what I did, but I felt like it, I had this kind of ripple effect on others around me. Um, mm. That was heavy to carry. That was like well, really. You yeah. were 23 years old. Of course, that would be heavy. Yeah. You know, ability. I mean, what did that feel like feeling like you were responsible and seeing that crumble? It was hard. I, I mean, like, to be honest, like when, um, I mean, my wife and I, we, I mean, we started doing like six months later, we started doing like, uh, counseling together and working ourselves and, and it was a really slow progression to rebuild our marriage but we did and once we did I was so ready to be out of that town I was like can we move like because I just feel judged by the whole town anytime you know and but we at the same time we felt like for me I felt like I wasn't we weren't supposed to like as much as I wanted to I felt like I needed to stay in there and not run away from it um and so yeah I I kind of learned um, to kind of put off the weight of everybody else and just focus on me and, and my marriage. And it, it went from this, like I had an influence circle and sphere of people to this very back to very basic raw, like I have my family that, and I had, you know, my family and a few close friends in my life. And so it went from, you know, big to little, and I had to learn that that was okay for me that it was okay to just, just be in this space. And, um, you know, one of the, or there was one person in particular that reached out after the, everything happened and they were the kind of one of those people that was just like, I'm done with the church. I'm done with this whole thing. I'm done with everything. And, and I actually had, um, performed their, their, their wedding, um, probably a year prior, you know, so I did some premarital counseling with them. I performed their wedding and, it was just a hard hit and it wasn't until six years later i was randomly back in coeur d'alene or seven years probably we were, we were back in coeur d'alene idaho and i was visiting and we were went to the the fair and i was walking through the fair with my family and i saw him and i didn't it, it like hit me i didn't know what to do with my emotions i was like last time he talked to me it was all this and i saw him seven years later and he comes up to me and hugs me and we both start crying and he's just like, Hey man, I forgive you. Um, you know, and it was like one of those, like people that like, I held on to this thing for a long time. And, uh, for him to, you know, just this random moment in the fair as people are watching two men hug and cry are like, what's going on, you know, but yeah. it, it was, it was a big, powerful moment for me. And it took some time to get there. And yeah you know, you talk about this weight that you carry and that how you self-medicated. When did you own the fact or, real, or come to the realization that you were an alcoholic? That took a lot of years. Um, I, so after my wife and I had been going through some counseling for some time, we were back together in the same house, uh, working on our marriage, uh, which is to me a miracle in itself that she was willing to stay and fight. Um, and you know, I, I had my counselor at one point be like, you know, Zach, I think you have a drinking problem. And I wasn't willing to accept it. I was like, no, I don't. Um, but to appease him and others around me, I said, yeah, I'll start, I'll go to AA for you guys. I can, I can stop drinking right now. That's no problem. And so I did, I started going to AA, but I was not believing I had a, a drinking problem and I did the things that people asked me to, I got a sponsor but I didn't really do anything with a sponsor. I never called him. I just said I had one. Uh, I'd go to meetings, but I'd sit in the back of the room and never talk. And I willpowered myself to be sober for a while. You know, I just kind of gripped my teeth and I was sober. And um, so to me, I was like, see, I don't have an issue. You guys aren't worried about it now because I'm not drinking. And that, that worked for a couple of years, to be honest. And then my wife and I 
kind of felt like we were able to leave Coeur d'Alene and within like a three week turnaround, we pick up and we moved to Maui, Hawaii. And the first year here was phenomenal in the regards of like my drinking wasn't an issue. We were enjoying Hawaii. It was fun. Um, we didn't know anybody. So it was just my tight little family unit, you know, for this time. And then stresses of life kind of kept building up and I turned towards alcohol. So I started like, I would, you know, at the end of a work day, I would pick up a six pack and drink it on my way home. And then I would hide it, you know, I, like in the fact like, no, I didn't drink. No, I'm fine. And I became really good at uh, manipulating and deceiving, you know, anyone around me. Um, yeah. So that's, and then it's, so for me, um, I think my turning point and realizing like that for me personally, when I was like, I think others knew around that, like maybe that kind of drinking problem. But when I realized it, I, um, I was home by myself at the house and I knew if I used my credit card to buy alcohol, my wife would ask questions of why or like what I was buying at a gas station. And so I had gone into my daughter's room and stolen money out of her piggy bank. And I remember sitting there on her bed, holding her money, being like, really, I'm choosing this. Um, but then I still chose that and took the money, bought some alcohol, drank. And that to me was a big, like, I remember coming to a group of people at that point, good friends here and just said, I have a drinking problem and I need help, you know? And so that, that was for me, when, when, what I would consider my road, beginning road of like recovery of going like, Hey, I, I have an issue help me out you guys and they did and everyone rallied around and um helped in a huge way what was that like sitting in your daughter's bedroom and picking up that piggy bank it was a low like when you talk about people hitting rock bottom that was kind of my bottom like um but it was for me, when I talk about, I think shame, that those are the shame. Those are those moments where you're sitting there going, really? Um, this is not me. This I'm a good dad. I love my kids. I love my wife. I love, you know, and like, so like to sit there and be doing something that you go, this is just not like, it was almost this, like watching yourself and go that, that, that is not the person I know I'm made to be. That's not the person I'm designed to be. That's not the person that's within me and but yet you still choose it and then um and then to feel that the the kind of heaviness and weight of it you know um i do i feel so extremely blessed that at that point in my life i had we we had a group of friends that we'd get together every week with and um i felt like i could be vulnerable with them and just they were still gonna love me so you know, for me to be able to know that I at least had a place I could go and go, Hey, here's what's going on. Um, and they didn't just say like, Oh, wow. Neat. We'll pray for you. They're like, all right, let's walk through this. Let's, let's figure it out. So when you say walk through it and figure it out, it kind of just makes me think what, what obstacles did you overcome on this journey to wellness? Oh man, a lot. Um, so I wasn't, you know, I think a lot of people go to like, recognize they're an alcoholic and then maybe get into an AA or go to a rehab program or do something and it works and they're done. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't work that way for me. I, so after this group of friends, um, one of them was actually a therapist and she's like, Hey, I want you to go meet with my friend uh, tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, okay. And it was another therapist. And I thought I was just going to go talk to another therapist. And I went there and I guess I didn't realize this therapist owned an uh, outpatient recovery program. And I went in, sat and talked with her. And this lady looked at me and she's like, my whole program's free to you. Show up tomorrow. You're in the program. And I was still, I was like, I don't even know what I'm in yet. Okay. You know, but I kept showing up. And, uh, and that to me, my big part of my journey was just keep showing up because I did, I did the out, I did the outpatient recovery program, but then I drank again. Uh, and I, I began to have this pattern of, I would relapse every two months, three months. Sometimes I can make it five months and, and then I would relapse. So it wouldn't be a long relapse of this, like go out for a week and drink. It would be like a one-time event. I would choose to say I'm done I, I, and I drink. And then, but I would, it would bring back shame. It would bring back mistrust in my marriage. 
it it would trigger my wife to this place like well, do i really know him do i trust him what's going on mm-hmm. um and so that that was my struggle continually like going why can't i get this i go to aa meetings and everybody else seems to get it i went to an outpatient program and everyone else seems to get it like why i'm going to therapy i'm doing everything and it's not working why you know and I think that to me was my biggest struggle of like, why, why, why is this not connecting? Um, And so I felt like I was a failure at even recovery. Like I couldn't get it. I couldn't figure it out. And one of the things they do in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is most meetings when you show up, if you're within your first 30 days of sobriety, they ask you to say your, your name and how many days you have. So, Hey, is anyone within the first 30 days? And I, always would have to find myself raising my hand going, Hey, I'm Zach. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm on day five. I'm on day seven, whatever. And it became such the biggest thing for me to, I, I didn't want to go to meetings just cause I was like, I don't want to show up again. And everyone looking and be like, Oh, that guy relapsed again. Here he is. Um, but I remember after finally having some time, I had somebody come up to me and they're like, you know how much courage it took for you to keep showing up after relapsing again and again. He's like, He's like, I would never have been able to do it. I would have left. I would have just gave up and continued to drink, you know? And so, yeah, my hurdle was myself not being able to just get it for me, not being able to um, fully embrace the fact that I was an alcoholic and I couldn't ever drink again, you know? What was that like though, having that, other person in AA come up to you and say how much courage it takes for you to come back over and over again. Oh, that, I mean, the, those, those little moments like that are what were allowed me to keep doing it, to keep showing up. You know, it was like, I sometimes don't think that people realize the impact we can have on one another. Cause for him, he probably just said it as like a neat, like, Hey man, that's really neat. You keep, you know, and like, to me, it was the world at that point. I was just like, thank you, because I don't know how I have the courage to keep coming back, you know? And so sometimes I feel like it's those little things that we say to one another to encourage or strengthen each other that we don't realize how much weight they can carry. And like, for me, that one carried weight that carried me through, you know, um, there's, I've had a lot of those little moments where if you ask the other person, they probably would have, wouldn't even remember the conversation. But for me, you know, it had an impact. So yeah, it, it, it gave me strength. It gave me, it gave me what I needed to keep kind of fighting this addiction. Have you, have you shared that with him? Mm, no. Why not? I don't know. That's a good question. I have shared it with, I, I have shared it with, um, so I haven't shared it with that guy cause I, I know exactly that person, but there was one person in uh, my recovery program that had a significant impact because, um, he was an old, old guy, stinky, raspy voice smoker. And every t- every morning I'd show up, he'd find me and give me a big hug and say, I'm glad you're here. Um, and that to me, that, I mean, like when you're kind of at this depressed, like I just relapsed, I'm, I don't want to be here. I feel like a failure. I walk in the rooms and there's this old guy ready to give me a hug. Um, that guy, you know, made a huge impact in my life too. And I did get a share with him because he just recently passed away from cancer. Um, but he was somebody that I, I remember I got at least a chance to say like, you imp- your hugs made a difference. Your hugs, every I knew if I showed up, I'd get a hug, you know, and it made a big difference. But no, the other guy, I need to, it, it, you know, I do. I think I need to tell him. Yeah, what, what's stopping you? I don't, I don't know if there is anything stopping me. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if they're actually like, if I have to really think about it, I don't know if there's any like personal like depth of why I wouldn't. Um, yeah, I don't know. When you talk about these um cyclical relapses, you know, where you'll go a period of time without drinking and then relapse and the shame and that, that disappointment in yourself that kind of surfaces, where, where do you find the strength to keep 
keep pushing through? What, what motivates you or drives you to keep moving forward? Um, I think for a long time, it was, it was on kind of my own strength, meaning like I, I would choose to be like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get it this time. I'm going to do it. I'm going to muster through it. I'm going to figure it out. And that lasted for a little bit and it would work for a little while, but it wasn't what I needed, I guess. Um, for me, it was, I had a moment a couple years ago, um, where I, I had an opportunity, a lot, I have a lot of great opportunities to get to spend time with just guys that we pour into each other's lives, but I had this opportunity and, uh, we took turns just sharing about our lives, what was going on. And I, I, at that point, I would honestly, if you had asked me if I, if I had worked through the shame of even the affair and all these things, I would have said, yes, I, I really feel like I had thoroughly gone through it as best as I could. And, but then I was with these group of guys and all of a sudden some like aspects of the shame, like di different. Cause I think shame comes in levels. I don't think it's this one thing. It's like, you work th through a level and then there's another and there's another and you kind of keep digging through the levels, but there was a deeper level. I don't think I was even aware of. Um, and I don't even know if I could pinpoint exactly what it was, but it was there. And I, and I, I remember working through that with them and, and just kind of crying and, and being aware of it. And then after that moment, um, I felt like I wasn't no longer defined by my affair or the fact that I was an alcoholic, because those things I, I put into play as like my defining who I was. And then it shifted for me where that wasn't my defining who I was. Those were things I did, um, but it wasn't me anymore. It was, I got, I moved to a place of being able to go like, that's not how I'm defined. I'm defined for me. It was, I'm defined by who God sees me as and who, who I am in his eyes. And that shifted everything. Um, so when you ask like how in those moments of relapse, I was able to kind of keep going for a while, it was strength on my own. And then it shifted to this like redefining how I see myself. And so I didn't see myself anymore as the guy that messed up, the guy that had the affair, the guy that ruined the church, the guy that's a bad parent, the guy that is an alcoholic. I saw myself as going, no, I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a child that's loved and um, is full of good and it has full of potential and full of these things. Um, and I struggle with these, then, then I struggle here, here's where I struggle, you know? And so for me, it was a, it was a mind shift. I think that allowed me to kind of keep going. And with that mind shift, redefining that narrative that you were constantly telling yourself, how did that positively impact your life with your wife, with your kids, with work? Um, well, I think partly like my recovery started to stick, like, um, meaning it became a lot, it, it was, it, it, it stopped being a fight to stay sober. It just became pretty like you hear an AA, like wait till the miracle happens. Like for me, that was the miracle happened. It was like something became where it was like, Hey, I don't, I don't desire to drink. Um, and, and then I, and then I even found myself two years ago, if you asked me to be vocal that and tell you as an alcoholic, I wouldn't have done that. If you asked me to share with you about my affair, I wouldn't have done that. Um, there became a voice inside of me that was like, Hey, I want to use your story. And, and I became comfortable with that. And so I think the shift within my, my, my marriage and my family and being a dad um, is I think when I stepped into being comfortable who I am and not afraid to share and not afraid to and like there's a for me there was a difference between like my my past failures no longer defined me but i still had my past failures so i got to use them and talk about them in a different light in a way and that shifted like this sense of freedom within my marriage um you know within being a dad um you know even like so my oldest son is 12 and uh, my wife and I, when I started my podcast, uh, I didn't feel like it was fair for me to continually ask people to share their stories and not have mine be out there. And so I asked her to record my story and like ask me questions and I got done with it. We both got done, put it out there and we looked at each other and I was like, oh, 
Jude, our oldest son, he likes to listen to our podcast. Or uh, he doesn't. I haven't talked to him about this at all, you know. And so it was like an aha moment for me. I was like, I need to have a sit down. And uh, and so yeah, like one morning going surfing with my son, you know, we're sitting there driving, and I go, hey, I want to I want to tell you some stuff and and talk through you some stuff with you, and you know, so I I shared it with him about the affair. You know, he knew about the struggle with alcohol and. He's like my biggest cheerleader, you know. He's like, "Dad, you're doing awesome!" Like, <laughs> "Yeah," you know. Like, he thinks it's great. So, but wow, wow, yeah. It, it must have taken a lot of courage to be able to talk to your son, what, eleven years old at the time? Yeah, and be able to yeah, and it was him. one of those. I well, I, I mean, I sought some counsel, and I was like, "Is he an, an appropriate age to understand this?" Like, he's a super smart, you know, like kind of wise for his age, kid. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and we've, I've been really intentional about like developing a relationship with all my kids, but that, that I want to be open and I want a household that when we fail, because we're all going to, that we don't run from it, that we can come and say, man, I messed up and this is it. And so for me, even though it was probably the hardest person I felt like I had to share with about it, I also felt like for me, I was like, man, I get to really show him, not talk about it, but show him what it means to be vulnerable with our, with each other and, and inside of our relationship. And so, you know, one of the things like my son and I try to do every week, and we're not consistent with every week, but we go surfing together, just him and I, and him and I both agree. Like I, there'll be weeks I'll be like, Hey, you want to invite a friend to come? He's like, no, dad, I just want you. And, uh, you know, for me, it's this, it's we don't even really care about the surfing sometimes it's more about the drive you know to the to the surf spot and the drive home and stopping to grab a donut or a cup of coffee on the way back and it's the conversations like that's where we've had the conversation about sex that's where we have conversations about girls that's where you know i've you know it's like he knows that's his safe space with me that we get this weekly like what's going on let's talk about it and he knows that i'll actually age appropriately and you know i'm not going to pour all my baggage onto my son but, you know, I'm going to involve him with what needs to be, I think, in my life. What's that like, having, having that special space with him? Oh, I love it. I, I do. I think, it's, um, I, I think it's crucial for kids to get individual space with their parents. You know, I try to date each one of my daughters. Um, and we rotate it, um, you know, as far as like, every Tuesday night in our house, uh, either my wife or I gets to date one of our kids, you know? And so it's just kind of like, we know, so the kids know like, Oh, is it my week on Tuesday? And, um, I just, there's something special about getting to space and time with each one individually. Um, you know, and then it's like, for me, I try to be really intentional about dating my wife, you know, and my kids to see that too, that they're like, Oh, dad's, dad's taking mom on a date, you know? And, um, just because we we need those special moments. Life gets busy with the to-dos and the the everything that just life happens, school, work, you know, keeping a house up, all these things that like just it, we need to stop. And I know for us, it's it's I can tell, especially with my girls, that when they need connection time, they they show it through their behaviors. You know, their behaviors you know, acting out and all these different things. And my wife will sometimes look and be like, they need a date with you. And I'm like, okay. You know, so. Wow. How, how important do you think that, um, that dating, I I love that concept um, of spending that time with your kids and just being there. How important in that uh, has it been to your recovery? Um, Really important. I mean, like my, my family has become, um, an important piece of my recovery because when I get to live into being the dad that I think I can be to my kids and I get those dating moments or those special moments and those times that I, I cherish them so much. I go, no joke. I think it was like two nights ago, we were sitting around the dinner table and just the family, nothing, nothing abnormal. We were just sitting there. I think my daughter was trying to finish a little bit of schoolwork. Um, We were all just sitting talking and I just like looked around. I was like, man, I'm so glad I'm sober right now. Like, I'm so glad. And they all looked at me kind of like oddly, like, yeah, dad, that's cool. Like, but like, there was like, (laughs) there was this like moment where I was like, you know, because I, 
I would hide it so often at times that I would come home buzzed or, you know, pretty tipsy. And I would be like, I'll put the kids to bed. And I'd go into my daughter's room and lay down with them. And I'd fall asleep next to them on the bed. But really what I was doing was passing out, Mm -hmm. you know, and like my wife would be like, you always fall asleep with the kids. I'm like, yeah, no, no, I'm just, you know, and, and then I'd wake up in a groggy, frustrated phase of life the next morning. And like, it's just, there, there's such, for me, such a joy in like the little stuff now, like knowing that I get to like interact with my kids on a different level and I get to take them on dates. I get to, you know, our kids are all doing the whole distance learning at home right now. Cause that's the way it is. I get to engage with them through school. Um, you know, to me, it's little things like, like life is really enjoyable when you're aware of the little stuff of the daily, you know? Absolutely. I think there was, um, there's some that you brought up about community and what I love about what you're talking about in your community is you have a community of guys, right? That you guys get together, you get vulnerable. And I think you mentioned before that you guys get together at least like once a year and just lay it all out there. Right. Can you talk more about the, that community and I, so I think I've been lucky. Um, and I say that because I know it doesn't always exist and you sometimes have to fight to, to get it. But, um, I've had it a couple of different times in my life, right out of college. I had a group of guys that we were all young and everyone after college all went to different places in the world. Like I think Africa, Indonesia, New York, we were all spread out. And, but we did make a commitment. We're like, we're going to get together every year. And we're going to get together so we can intentionally invest into each other's life. And that became really fun because it was like, we were young and it was, uh, you got a letter in the mail that just said a time and a place. And so the first place I remember was like, I got a letter and it just says the oldest pub in Dublin on this date. And I knew if I showed up there, my friends would be there. And then we just spent a couple of weeks together, just really like investing into each other's life and whatever we were doing and we became like a sounding board for each other so we did that for quite a few years until everybody started having families and kids and then it became this like how do we do it and it kind of phased out um and then in the recent years i had a group of guys that when i originally lived back in idaho we a lot of us shared a co-op kind of workspace together and everyone life happened we all kind of moved again and but we, one of the guys has really taken the initiative, which has been a huge, huge deal. Um, he shoots a text every morning, you know, to the group, like, Hey, thinking about you guys, love you guys, praying for you guys. This is my thought for the day. And like that, just that little bit. And he, I'm amazed he does it every day because sometimes there's days, none of us reply, you know? And, but in that we decided let's all get together and we got together and it was one of those reasons like no one really knew why but we're like let's get together so we got together on the Oregon coast uh last year and once we all got together we all had, we were very like-minded and like we just said let's divide up the time we have together and then just I don't want to say like put someone on the hot spot but it was like it's your turn to share your life everything going on and we're going to dive into like investing into you and that's this time and we did that with each person throughout the whole time we were together and it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was like literally to me, like better than any retreat I could have went to better than any conference. It was this like life giving time where I knew these guys were going to be honest, real vulnerable themselves. And then it created a space for me to get to be, and just to open up and share and talk. And, um, I think everybody needs it. You know, I just do. I think, um, we weren't designed to walk through life alone. I think we were designed to walk through it with others. And so I know that I'm better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better business owner. I'm a better, all these things when I have other people around me that are challenging me, you know, or calling me out or uh, just listening and, you know, willing to sit there and cry with me. So, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a key part to me. It's like, having people in my life. What a, what a life you've led. Um, and I'm curious, you know, some listeners out there might also be struggling with addiction. What is one thing that you would share with others who may be on a similar 
similar path struggling with addiction? I think my big message right now that I'm really trying to work with people on it, when it comes to addiction is um, what worked for me may not work for you. And for some reason in the addiction world, we put two paths ahead of people. We say you either go to a recovery center or you get into like an AA meeting situation. And those things are both phenomenal. I think they both work, but it may not work the way that everyone tells you it needs to for you. So like my, I guess my advice to people that are maybe continually finding themselves relapsing or just finally aware that they have a, 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 like an addiction issue is don't give up. Um, like part of recovery is the relapse. Meaning like when the relapse happens, if you can embrace it as part of the recovery and celebrate the time in between, like I had someone that really would work with me when I relapse, they'd be like, but how many days did you not drink? That's amazing. You know? So get back up and do more. And I was just like, that's a way better outlook than to have shame and guilt and feel like you failed is to like pick yourself back up and go, um, okay. Like look at the days in between that I, I did stay sober. So my encouragement is don't give up and fight for everything to find a, something like, when I say a program, um, you know, some people that program means they go to an AA meeting every day. Some people a program looks like for me, so for me, my program looks like um, I go to two AA meetings a week. I go to a program called Celebrate Recovery uh, one day a week and I'm kind of involved in that. And then my program also means that I put it on my calendar every week sometime to do self-care, to like get in the water or go surf or do something for myself that brings me joy. Uh, part of my program means that I actually take every Sunday and I sit down and I write my calendar out. So my family sees it and my wife can go, Hey, like great job. Like you created space and time or your calendar looks crazy and you have no time for your self care. Um, but that's part of my, like, these are all part of my recovery things. And, um, for me, my other pieces, I meet with a mentor, um, every, every week we just, you know, I get meet at his house at six in the morning and we just have watch the sunrise and have a good conversation, you know? So that's what works for me. I tried all the, I tried a lot of different things, but finally I found something that goes, this works. Um, so yeah, just f fight to find a program that works for you and be okay failing or having relapse along the way until you get it. I, I had a question for you regarding, uh, you know, the first time that you started going to AA and you're saying, hey, I can't get through this program. It's not sticking. What was it like to then continue in some of these programs after you'd had that internal shift for yourself? Um, they became much more life-giving and enjoyable. So when I first would go to an AA meeting, I felt like, I looked at all the differences versus the similarities in us, in people. So I would go into a room and I would look at all the differences. Oh, look at the difference here, or you are different here because of this, or, you know, you're an alcoholic because of this, I'm not that. And so I see differences and now I can walk into a room and I can go, man, look at all the similarities we have, um, which shifted because then it became uh, such a better you connected to people on a different level versus like me trying to like separate us and go, Oh, we're different because maybe you had a traumatic childhood. I didn't, or the, whatever it was, the separation. Um, you know, the, like one of the big sayings in a is like always get into the middle of the herd. It's the safest place to be. And there's some truth to that because if you show up to a meeting, sit on the outside, never talk to anybody and come five minutes late, leave five minutes early, you're not going to experience it. You know, what the experience of AA is, is the person, the, the old guy that will give you a hug when you show up, you know, it, it's those moments. Sometimes, sometimes I go and I hear nothing as far as like advice or the message that's good. But what I do see is I could show up and I can look around the room and I can go, Hey, look at the fact that I get to be with a group of people that are, are committed to making their lives better. And that's exciting. You know, and if that's it, if that's all I get to walk away with is going, cool. We get to we get to work on our life today. Um, I don't know if that answered your question at all, but that's where I went. 
No, it, it absolutely <laughs> does. Cause I mean, it's, it's just having that experience. Cause I, I do, um, you know, I very much had a traumatic childhood, but I did not yeah. go down the road of alcoholism. I had right. other self-harming things that I am now realizing are coming to the surface of like, oh yeah, those things you were doing, that was self-harm. Yeah. It wasn't that kind of self-harm, but. Um, um, I do have a question about your podcast. So it, it's called Braving the Journey and it, and I know it's dedicated to kind of exploring the stories of others and the struggles that they go through. Was that something that kind of emerged during your recovery process? Um, yeah, you know, I think for me, um, the heart behind the podcast is, um, when, when I was kind of struggling and not grasping my recovery or even like all the way back to the affair, one of the things I began to learn is in my struggles, whatever they were, I've had a tendency to always want to move towards isolation and I wanted to believe this lie that like, I'm the only one that struggled with this, you know, like, to be honest, like my story isn't unique. There's pastors out there that have had affairs and have blown up their lives in those ways. Like I'm not, I'm not unique in that, but mm -hmm. when I, in the midst of it, I wanted to believe like, man, I'm the only one that struggles um, with this, whatever this is. And so my heart behind the podcast was to go, I want people to hear stories and go, Oh, I'm not alone. Oh, like someone else is there because sometimes it's that little shift that when they, they go, I'm not the only one, then they can step into the space of going, what do I do now? How do I kind of move towards a place of healing? How do I move towards, um, you know, recovery? And so for me personally, like I, I felt disqualified for years because of the shame I felt attached to my, my things. And when I say disqualified, I meant like disqualified to speak into anyone else's life, to speak truth to. And then, so for me, when this shift changed that I wasn't identified anymore by my past, there became this like sense of like, you have a voice and you can share. And so the, you know, the podcast kind of became my first platform to go like, let's share, let's talk stories. Let's hear people's stories. Let, you know, and then, you know, I'm moving into that more of a um, speaking and coaching where I want to be able to work with people that I want to, I want to, I want someone that's like, I can't get this addiction thing to call me and be like, let's figure it out together. Let's, let's walk this out, you know? Um, Cause there's so many people trying to do this alone. Absolutely. City and I were actually just talking about that this morning about how not only important stories are and how they can connect us. But even if just one person hears yeah. your story, they, they feel that, you know, maybe they're not alone because yeah. it's, it's easy to, to get lost in the noise of everything that's going on in the world and to feel isolated. So I appreciate you sharing your story. And um, so we're, if it's cool with you, we'd like to ask you our signature questions. The first, oh, yeah. the first one being reflecting back what would you tell your younger self? To learn to have some grace for yourself. I think I, I easily can extend grace to everybody else around me, but for some reason to extend grace to myself was the thing that was really difficult. So mm -hmm. I think just learning to be okay to have some grace. Thank you for that. Looking forward what one wish do you have for yourself on your current journey? Wish for myself or what? Yeah. So wish, wish for myself. Um, I think it would be, I mean, there's the obvious, like my wish to continually stay sober. Um, but I think it would be, the wish that I will continually find my voice and that my voice hopefully can help others, um, whatever capacity that looks like and not, not be afraid to continually be vulnerable. Those are awesome wishes. Awesome answers. Thank you so much, Zach, for sharing your story with us today. It's yeah, exceptionally absolutely. Powerful. You can learn more about Zach on his Instagram for his podcast, Braving the Journey, 
we'll link this information on our website. What struggles do you feel alone in? We encourage you to share and connect with us on our Facebook community. We want to thank our producer and music director, Ron Johnson. This has been an Astronomicus DMR production. Thank you for listening. Remember, it's never too late and you're right on time.